So today I'm trying to speak about the possibility of a Shi'i theology in a German sense, which is also um, where I would like to see, can we use modern historical critical approaches to Hadith? It is especially important to work um, on this area because modern studies of Islam have been too focused on the Quran or rationalist readings of Kalam at the expense of due attention to the Islamic tradition, not the least the Hadith. Uh, in this talk, I will first briefly introduce the historical critical approaches and how they are problematic for Hadith studies, especially if a theological perspective is taken into account. Then I will introduce the different approaches to Hadith and introduce the possibilities of rigorous historical approach combined with a theologically relevant one. What I promise to offer here is not outright solutions, but as mentioned in the title, title some observations, and that is why I will benefit a lot from your observations as well. Historical critical approaches emerged in the 19th century, and despite all the controversies around them, soon became predominant approaches in studying scriptures. While earlier theologically driven studies of the Bible rested on an idea of coherence in a way that even differences and contradictions were harmonized, the historical critical scholar looks precisely for those contradictions. According to Nikolai Zinai, um, and here I quote, to read scripture historically critically is to systematically suspend the question of its truth, coherence, and contemporary relevance, to be attentive to inconsistencies and redundancies within scripture, as well as between scripture and later beliefs, and to account for the textual phenomena thus observed by means of historical models, which often include complicated redactional processes, end quote. The historical critical scholar does not have any qualms with a Pentateuch that is redacted from five different sources, with the gap between the Jesus of history and the later development of his image in the Gospels and other parts of the Christian tradition, the fairly late dating of the emergence of the Psalms or the Pentateuch, the non-existence of certain biblical figures such as Abraham or Moses, the distortion of Pauline message in Acts, the false attribution of certain letters to Paul, among other things. It is true that main mainstream Protestant theology and less powerfully Catholic theology did manage to establish an orthodoxy based on the data of historical criticism, Yet, historical criticism is meant not to satisfy the needs of theology or answer its questions. Rather, it is a theology that tries to uh, adapt itself to historical criticism. And of course, here I just uh, should briefly mention the uh, criticism that Professor Lickenhausen mentioned earlier uh, on the side of those who work on ideologies of the of religious studies and who say that historical criticism is itself based on certain theological assumptions, mostly Protestant Christian theological assumptions. Um, and while I appreciate uh, that these are important criticisms and they should be taken into account, but mostly his, this sense of neutral historical criticism has been prevailing and um, theologians have been trying to adapt themselves to the data of historical criticism. Historical critical approaches to the Bible can be divided to, divided to source criticism, research about central figures such as Jesus, social scientific studies, and to some extent form criticism, although the latter is based more on the structure of the text than the historical context. In source criticism, the sources of a particular passage are, are drawn out. For example, we know through source criticism that the Gospel of Mark preceded Matthew and Luke and was perhaps their major source. We can also reconstruct Q according to the pieces that are shared between Matthew and Luke but do not exist in Mark. We can understand that the Pentateuch, which can be dated to the 6th century BCE, i.e. almost seven centuries after the presumed exodus, was itself composed out of four distinct sources, that is EJPD, in um, historical Jesus research, we try to see how far Jesus can be unearthed from the mass of theological reports in the Gospels. In social scientific studies, we use the methods of the social sciences to make better sense of the text. Archaeological data are also very helpful in reconstructing the context of the Bible. Form criticism can be part of the historical uh, critical approaches only insofar as it reconstructs the Sitz im Leben, 
of a certain passage according to its genre. Historical scholars have their own differences, not only in the results they reach, but also in terms of their assumptions. For example, in the lack of any independent ev evidence for the event of Exodus, that is Moses coming out of Egypt and going to Canaan, biblical archaeologies range from minimalist to maximalist. The minimalists hold that only the things that can be independently proved are to be accepted, while the maximalists accept the biblical description unless anything to, to the contrary is shown. Hence, for the minimalists, the exodus did not happen, while for the maximalists, exodus did happen as long as nothing proving to the contrary is proved. From very, very early on, historical critical approaches have been applied to the study of Islam, not the least in Hadith studies. The application of historical criticism in Hadith studies does not sound as problematic as it might be with the Quran. Muslims themselves, at least those in the rationalist circles, <coughs> excuse me, at least those in the rationalist circles subjected Hadiths to scrutiny and detailed examination. Hadith was not the word of God preserved throughout the centuries. Due to its oral nature, it's fairly late writing down. It's dependent on the memories and narrations of fallible transmitters and the many contradictions within it. Many hadiths could just be thrown out as forgeries. However, the traditional hadith criticism served the purposes of theology, went in the direction direction of harmony did not diverge too much from mainstream classical histories of Islam and was based on theologically sanctioned methods. The main criterion in Hadith examination was the question of authenticity, especially in terms of the line of transmitters. If the transmission itself was sound, uh, that is, there were enough transmitters in the line to make transmission, the transmission chronologically and geographically plausible, the transmitters had to be examined according to certain virtues, i.e. their doctrinal and moral credibility. Thus, if the line of transmission is unbroken and chronologically plausible, and the transmitters stand in high credibility, the hadith is probably authentic. There is also another important criteria, that is the content of the hadith, which should not go against the Quran, Islamic history, and what we believe regarding the character of the prophet, prophet and in the Shi'i case, the imams. The general corpus of Islamic literature, the accepted data of history and science and reason, among other things. While this criterion has been taken seriously, a desire for theological harmony usually prevailed. Thus, a scholar might find inconsistencies, but use ta'wil to harmonize them. The non-Muslim historical critic does not have any problem with inconsistencies and even looks for them to construct a fragmented history. They will even detach the question of character from the question of authenticity. That is why, for the historical critical scholar, there is no reason to accept that a line of transmission really goes back to the prophet only because it claims to. Written evidences are more reliable and the intentions behind them should be uncovered first. The turn of the century Orientalists most famously discredited many hadiths, claiming that they emerged amidst the legal debates of the second century after Hijra, only to support the claims of the different sides of the controversy. Why, where exactly did they emerge? And we have a lot of debates by different um, Orientalists about that. And I skip that. More recently, a new kind of hadith criticism ha has emerged, uh, which is based on rationalist criteria. And I'm here mentioning the Islamic side, not the Orientalist side. That is, uh, these rationalist Muslims focus on the Quran, use the hadiths only very sparsely and selectively, and question the authenticity of many problematic hadiths only when they have to, based on the rational beauty and ugliness. Khalid Abu al-Fadl's val invaluable work, which centers on repudiating the literalist hadith-centered readings in is some such examples. Abu al-Fadl's work is fairly unprecedented in terms of engagement with the textual tradition as represented in Wahhabi or Salafi literature. Abu al-Fadl uses beauty as a hermeneutical strategy to read the text in their context and discern its relevance for Muslims. 
similar strategies have been used by certain other uh, rationalist scholars, such as Ahmad Qabel and other Shia and Sunni scholars. Now the question is how far can historical critical approaches contribute to Islamic Hadith criticism? Especially if we take into account the fact that most of the criticism, this latter movement that I just mentioned, comes from the rationalist circles. Can we have a scholarship, Hadith scholarship, that is both faithful to historical critical approaches, but does not necessarily be belong to the rationalist strand? Uh, we are, after all, dealing with two entirely different epistemological systems, the validation resting on different criteria and aiming at separate goals. The traditional Muslim Hadith, crit hadith criticism relies on a system of tawthiq or authentication, where the reputation of a transmitter, as reported, as reported in Rajal collections, determines the authenticity of the Hadith that they report. Not only the reliance of the said reputation upon systems of power and authority go on questions, but also they are made in the first place to establish that authority. The alleged virtues of the characters, including their adherence to the doctrinal orthodoxy, is an important factor. So is the character of the prophet and the imams portrayed in highly dramatized fashion and according to the ideal religious hero. They could not have said something that runs contrary to what we imagine about them. That is, the imams and the prophets could not have said something that runs contrary to what we imagine about them. And that picture is not only imaginary, but also based on the details that are given in the authoritative literature itself. So it seems a bit circular in this instance. The orientalist historical approach is entirely in the opposite direction. It discredits the systems of virtue and doctrinal authentication, as it also doubts the Tawfiq system. It also does not have any qualms with non-heroic accounts of saints, prophets, and imams. <coughs> While I, I appreciate that here we are dealing with two entirely different epistemological systems, I would like to investigate how far a theological reading of hadiths can take into account the findings of historical critical approaches. My question rises mainly from the gap in innovative theological readings where rationalist criteria lead to undermining hadiths rather than pl playing with the criteria that do, do already exist in hadith studies, such as the ones that I mentioned with regards to content criticism. To summarize, we can roughly divide hadith criticism into four branches two by Orientalists and two by modern Hadith critics. I will discuss the possibilities and obstacles in a fifth approach. Orientalists, uh, meaning those without any concern for the theological re relevance of a Hadith, can be, can be the likes of skeptics and revisionists, beginning with Gold Zihir, Schacht, and culminating in Michael Cook. They are too disappointed in the possibility of a hadith being authenticated and can at best date the hadith to the time of the common link, if not the time of the writing down of the hadith. The second group of Orientalists, like Harald Mutzki, Fuad Siskin, um, and others, are not as cynical and have experimented with different methods. The third and the fourth groups belong to the Muslim scholars who have accepted modern Hadith criticism. For example, those who apply older, well-established methodologies, mostly focusing on the trustworthiness of the transmitters, the soundness of the link between them, the existence of several lines of transmission, as well as methods of content criticism, such as exposure to the Quran and a more heuristic perspective about like what I just mentioned, examining it in light of the general uh, authoritative literature. And the fourth group uh, are uh, the rationalists who start with criteria outside the text itself, just such as a concern for peaceful coexistence or rational behavior, human rights, and the more general theologically accepted criterion of beauty. Of course, the line between these two latter groups uh, the, uh, cannot easily be drawn. Neither is any one of the four groups that I just mentioned composed of monolithic tendencies. 
Now I would like to discern what happens when we can use the methods of rigorous historical critical approaches and combine them with the question of theological relevance. My proposal is not based on an attempt to bring close two approaches that are foundationally and epistemologically mm, contrary. Besides, while most of the attempts of at least the first three groups are limited to the examination of the transmitters and the sources, here I focus on important criteria in Islamic content criticism, namely the compatibility of the meaning of the Hadith with the Quran, scientific findings, as well as historical data. My concern is also theologically inflected because I hold that Islamic scholarship can benefit from human sciences and can be relevant to rationalist concerns. I especially focus on the content of the text, and I use that because we do have that within the well-established um, hadith st studies in uh, Muslim hadith criticism, and uh, where not only the line of transmission, but the content of the hadith is important for examining the authenticity of hadith. So I here focus on the question of content. Um, here I have a few cases, and I think that we should examine the cases one by one and see where uh, whether we have uh, the possibility of hadith criticism uh, using historical critical approaches. Uh, one um, case is uh, where we have certain information about characters and historical events and movements in light of historical criticism, and that is um, contrary to what we find in um, hadith. Many times in hadith, we do not need to go too far in historical research to know that certain things are attributed to the Jews and Christians that cannot be substantiated, or when certain stories about prophets are told that cannot be found in any other sources. What are we to do with these? Here I suggest that we read hadiths as stories with certain rhetorical purposes. They were not said to tell us about histories, but to teach us lessons. This is also true about Quranic stories, and I here refer to what I find in, um, in uh, a book by uh, Muhammad Ahmad Khalafullah, which belongs to a few decades ago and which was very controversial, but I find it plausible and convincing in many ways that um, the Quran was not planning to tell us about history as such, but was planning to persuade its audience about the truth of its message. And uh, I think a similar thing can be about the Hadith. Uh, the second case is when mm, we find that the um, Hadiths are not compatible with certain interpretations of the Quran that are themselves based on historical critical approaches. So we know that one of the important criteria for Hadith criticism is that, it, uh, that the Hadith and the Quran should not be incompatible. Now we might find that according to historical critical approaches, uh, we have certain interpretations of certain passages of the Quran, which is not compatible with what we find in Hadith. Um, so, um, for example, we have um, uh, we have we reach uh, some conclusions um, through historical critical approaches about the time of the uh, sending down of certain surahs, but we have something quite different in the hadith. And which are we going to prefer, the findings of historical criticism or the findings of hadith? It would be nice to be able to harmonize them, but it's not always the case. So uh, we might need to uh, focus more on the findings of historical criticism um, or uh, see where what the evidences that each party brings are. We might have another case where we find events or elements uh, that seem to be non-scientific or pseudo-scientific or seem uh, too supernatural or um, according to a modern scientific perspective uh, might seem superstitious. What are, we do to do? what are we to do with these? So 
um, in the well-established Hadith criticism, we have this thing that if those um, supernatural events are for the purpose of proving the prophethood of the prophet or the truth of Islam or the or the uh, or the truth of the message of the imams, then um, we might be able to accept them. But if not, then we have no reason to accept that they are true. But with historical critical uh, uh, approaches, we have a total rejection of these events because they cannot be scientifically proven in any way. So um, here, I think, um, I don't have a particular su suggestion, but I think here we cannot escape a rationalist approach, whether be it from Kalam, a rationalist Kalam, or rationalist Usul. And um, here, um, I don't think that we can find anything from within Hadith criticism itself that helps us decide uh, whether we can rely on the content of the, these hadiths, we have to go outside hadith criticism to rationalist kalam and rationalist usu. And then we have this other case where we have um, hadiths that go counter to certain theological precepts or are um, substantiated according to the question of character, for example, where we say the prophet couldn't have said this and that, or we, for example, find some things that are against what we as modern rationalist people believe to be um, ideas about human rights. For example, what is reported, for example, some of the women degrading passages um, or similar things that we don't find very comfortable with our modern sensibilities. Um, uh, again, we have a critical point here because we have uh, theological hadiths. I mean, all hadiths are theological in some sense, but what I mean is that so hadiths that might be compatible with certain doctrines, but also we have similar hadiths that might be just the opposite. For example, when it comes to divine embodiment, we have just two different things going on. And then we also have our own rationalist system of doctrinal beliefs and um, so if we find texts that are, go counter to them we might have certain problems. Again I think that this should also be left to discussion. Um, what I suggest is that a history of ideas can be very helpful. For example we can discuss the break between the Hadith generation and the Quran generation as well as the break between the later theologies and the Nas where the texts themselves should be given full attention. So here, a history of ideas can be very helpful, as well as certain um, rationalist uh, understandings. Um, we also do have uh, certain um, hadiths that are clearly for confessional um, claims at, in a particular period in time. And we should be aware of that and th their timing and what they meant to say at that particular time and then translate them to our own time. Um, so I uh, conclude here. Hadith is as much the child of its age as is the Quran. While the tradition attributes separate origins to the kind, two kinds of literature, both are divine. Hence, the Islamic reform has gone astray when it has tried to focus on the Quran or rationalist explications of theology, neglecting the Hadith. Reviewing the different historical approaches to Hadith in Western scholarship of Islam, as well as the Muslim tradition itself, I suggested that we can integrate it to content, crit content criticism and discuss the particular cases of content. I accept that one's theological stance plays a huge role in dealing with the question of history, but I would like to emphasize that theology should not mean the wholesale or should not entail the wholesale neglect of the Hadith tradition. One final question so that we should deal with today is how far my approach as well as my suggestions are compatible with the particular Shi'i perspective. It is true that Shi'i Hadith collections as well as their criteria of authentication are entirely different from the Sunni ones. Yet given that much of the above suggestions approach something like a rationalist approach and in fact radicalizes what has already been proposed in rationalist approaches in hadith criticism, 
I associate myself with the with the said approaches within the Shia. An usuli and adli approach can be to some extent be compatible with my above points or my suggestions, let's say. Having said that, we have to recognize that rationalism is not the only strand of Shia. Hadith criticism has always been very controversial and even rationalists have always been very aware of the debates and the difficulty of defending their position in face of harsh criticism. Extreme rationalism can tantamount to undermining the value of the Nas. When speaking of Hadith criticism based on historical critical approaches, we should recognize the nuances of the traditional Hadith criticism according to its peculiar epistemological conditions, as well as the diversity of theological approaches within the Shia that inevitably influence one's methodology. Thank you very much.